Well, good morning. morning. I almost hate to interrupt all that good talking and laughing and everything. It sounds like y'all having a good time. Welcome to Saluda Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Jeff. It's so good to see you this morning. Looks like we got a lot of folks out on vacation this morning, but you know what? The folks that are here, we're going to worship. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, I've got a couple of announcements I'd like to pass on. Some of these are in your bulletin. Some are not. I do want to make note of a new adult Bible study that's starting tonight at 6 p.m. Note that time change. We're, we're moving Sunday nights to 6 p.m., kind of to line up with our Wednesday night time frame as well. Uh, what's new about tonight is the adult version. We've been having the men and women meet separately, but tonight we're going to start a summer series where they're going to meet together in the sanctuary. That'll be at 6 p.m. I'm going to be leading that. We're going to be going through the book of Ephesians. So. I'm really excited about that. I hope you'll come and join us tonight, 6 p.m. I can't say that number enough for us all to remember. Also, uh, right below that in your bulletin, uh, men, I need you paying attention to this. I need all men's eyes on the bulletin. I started to have Miss Billy put it up behind me. Uh, A men's ministry, I'm going to call it a float trip, buddy. You got it rafting trip in here, but we're trying to revive the men's ministry here. You see, the ladies got together about a month ago, and they had 38, buddy, they had 38 women show up that night. I expect the men ought to be competitive and try to have a same number, maybe higher. Maybe we can do that. We're going to get a little crazy and go down a river up in North Carolina. Mr. Buddy has uh, found us a trip to go on. That's going to be on the 17th of July. Cost is $50 per person, but we need to know the number of men going by next Sunday. So if you're interested in going... I could answer questions. He could answer questions. There's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. We'd love it if you'd go. We're, we're planning on taking the bus up there. Uh, it'll be probably leaving around 9 or 10 in the morning and getting, around, getting back around 7 or 8 that night. It's going to include a float trip and uh, food. Food is always good when men are in the picture. A uh, couple, three things that are not in your bulletin. I've got a picture I have to show you. I'm going to wait till it pops up. Oh, let's hear it. Oh, that is Lainey Briggs Gardner. Kaysen and Lindsley had their child this last Wednesday uh, about noontime when she was born. I love the bow. I love the prettiness. Everything's just perfect about that picture. Everybody's doing fine. I believe they're home, uh, but wanted to congratulate them. Uh, from that exciting news, we also found out this morning uh, is that Miss Norma Abel did pass away this morning early on. Uh, we we, we uh, grieve for the family, but we celebrate that she's in the presence of Jesus. That's exactly where she wanted to be. I uh, spoke with her last week, and she was longing to be in the presence of Jesus. The, the, the last thing I want to bring up, and I've got another picture. I'm all about the pictures this morning, is our youth group. They headed off yesterday about 9 o'clock, uh, and that is most of them. There's two missing, I believe, uh, Sid and Abby were missing. They're playing in a ball tournament this weekend. They're going to join them, uh, but they're in the Knoxville area, and their names are in the bulletin. And my request of you this morning and throughout this week is that you would pray over this entire team, pray over them as a group, pray over them uh, individually, pray for their parents. Some Some of the parents, this is the first time that they've been away from their children for a while. And see, Bill's laughing at that, but you, you remember being there, right? That first time's kind of tough, but they're out serving the Lord in Knoxville. I believe they're going to be putting on a roof, helping out others, putting a roof on a house. Uh, and so we're excited about them serving the Lord throughout this week. It's my hope and prayer that they come back changed from this mission trip. And so this morning as we open, I want to pray over these families Uh, I want to pray over this group, but also I want to pray over our services. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we we just give you all the praise and all the glory. Father, you are so, so good to us each and every day, and I just praise you for that. This morning, uh, I specifically want to lift up, uh, Father, the family of of Miss Norma Abel. Father, they've been on this transitional journey over the last week, and Father, I know they are grieving this morning, but Father, we are rejoicing knowing that she is in your presence this morning. I just thank you so much for the life of Miss Norma. Father, I thank you so much uh, for Kaysen and and Lindsley and their child, Father, being born this week. I just lift you up and and praise you for that birth. Father, we we just see her coming into this world, and we look forward to the things that she's going to do. And I just pray over that family as they raise this child in this world that they live in. Father, I also lift up our youth group. 
Father, what a wonderful thing to see young people going out into this world, serving, serving in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray over this team, each and every one of the youth. I pray over Pastor Brandon this morning. I pray over Miss Mitzi, uh, Miss Helen, who are there chaperoning. Father, I just pray over the entire team that they would have a wonderful time. Uh, Father, that they would have a great time in fellowship, but also in service. And Father, I pray for each and every one of them that they would have an opportunity to share the gospel with someone this week and that they would come back changed. And Father, I pray over our services this morning. Father, I just pray that you'd work in a mighty, mighty way. Touch each and every heart that's here today. Allow us to feel your presence. Allow the Holy Spirit, Father, just to work in a mighty way, a mighty way that we too would be changed after this service. Father, we just glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you please stand? I, uh, I told my Sunday school class that I can find a lot of ways to hurt myself right around the house. I don't need to go on a raft trip to hurt myself. So, anyway, love you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst time. <laughs> All righty. What a, what a joy it is to be in church this morning. Uh, we get to come and fellowship with other people and worship the Lord our God, who is our cornerstone. <laughs>
scripture this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father God, I just thank you for this day that you've made and given to us. I thank you for this opportunity that we have to come and divide your word, Lord. May it be a, a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Pray for uh, Brother Jeff as he brings the message, Lord. And uh, we just thank you for him and, again, the, the, our youth pastor and the ones that have gone on the trip. We just lift them up to you. Thank you for these gifts, Lord, that uh, they may be used to bring honor and glory to you. And we just thank you for the victory in Jesus that we have. In his name we pray. Amen. in the in the bulletin today I was going to leave it as a surprise for our preacher our pastor because this is his favorite song let's all stand and sing victory in Jesus
All right, y'all, it's time for the children's corner. I know I'm not Pastor Brandon, but I guess I'll try my best. All right, Kate, if you don't mind coming down, because it's nice and pretty lonely up here. And Connor, you can come too if you like, buddy. That works too. All right, you mind holding this? All right, buddy, come up here. All right, so I didn't know, I don't think you know this about me, but I love the gym. I love working out. I know it might not look like it, but just give it a couple years. But um, so I got four facts right there that is about the gym and working out. So can you show me the first one? Okay. Music improves workout performance. Do you all think that's true? No, it's not true? Well, I guess it just depends on the person. Because if I don't have music, I'm not going to do well. I'll just give up like after the first set. All right, what's the next one? You get sick less often when you work out. What, you think that's true? Yeah. I think that's true because it helps your immune system, I guess. I don't know. That's what the research said. And then working out helps you sleep better. What do you think about that, Connor? You think that's true? Maybe. Not if you work out late at night, right? Yeah, 50-50, yeah. I guess that's true for different people, I don't know. And then working out can improve the look of your skin. What about that one? True? What do you think? True? Yeah, I think that's true. Unless you get, like, really sweaty and you get acne everywhere. But, uh, so a lot of those facts are actually true because I researched them, right, to make sure they are true. But now in life... We're going to be told a lot of things that aren't truth. But John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. So when, just like I research those facts to make sure they're true, we can always go to the Bible to find the truth. Remember, everything in the Bible is true, no matter what other people say. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for stay. Thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for us to be able to come here to church and just worship you, Lord. And thank you for giving us the Bible so we can know the truth no matter what others say, Lord. Now let's just always remember it, God, that your word is the truth. So thank you, God, for this day. Help us, to, help us take something out of Pastor Jeff's message and apply it to our everyday lives. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, last week and this week, we both uh, both weeks we had our our interns up here. And Paul, I appreciate that. And Helen, I, I did not say that last week, and I felt bad all week long. I thought she did a great job as well. She is with Pastor Brandon this morning, and so we're, we're thrilled to have our interns filling in and and helping Pastor Brandon along the way. We have a a busy busy schedule this summer as it pertain, per, pertains to our youth and even activities that we have going on. So uh, anyway, Paul, thank you for that. That was, that was awesome. And, and Bill, thank you for picking my, I, don't, I was about to say my song, but uh, I, I, love, I love Victory in Jesus just so much that uh, that, that song means to me. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you, dear Lord, for, for just blessing us so abundantly. I thank you for blessing me. Father, I stand here a humble man this morning. Humbled by the things that I've seen this week. Humbled by the experiences that I've been a part of. Humbled to be in your grace and your mercy each and every day. And Father, I'm humbled, humbled to be able to share this message this morning. And Father, I pray, I pray indeed that we would Push aside all the distractions that we have. That we would let our guard down. Father, that we would just focus on you. Hear your words. Learn from your precious words. Father, I pray that you would impart and impute yourself upon our hearts this morning with this message. And Father, I pray that you grant me the strength that I need. 
Father, I pray this morning that you would literally hide me behind the cross. Father, that your words would be heard clearly by each of us. Father, indeed, we want to be changed people. Change us. Refine us. Use us. And may your will be done in each and every heart that's here. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the other day I was asked to come up with a new security question for one of my online accounts. I don't know if y'all have to deal with that time to time. I, I just saw a couple of sighs, like, really, we're going to talk about that on a Sunday morning. You know, you have an online account, you have a user ID, and you got a password, and occasionally they will call you, or not call you, but they will ask you to come up with security questions that um, if you forget your password, which I'm one of those, that uh, you, can, you can ask for one of the questions to be asked of you, and they will reset your password. And, and so, you know, they usually give you two or three different random questions that they can use. And this one happened to be uh, who my favorite teacher was, my favorite teacher. And, and I've got a lot of teachers that I consider favorites, and, and many of you know I've got my Aunt Ellie who watches in quite often Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. She was my fourth grade teacher, and, and I'll tell you, she was one of my favorite teachers, if not my favorite teachers, and I'll pause and say, Aunt Ellie, I love you so much. Um, but I didn't list her because that would be too obvious. Uh, and so I listed another uh, person. Um, you know, Kelly and, and Jeffrey both have heard this person's name, I believe. His name is Don Emmanuel. Um, and now I just broadcasted that, so all of a sudden I'm going to have to change my security question. Just now dawned on me. Okay, so much for security. So, just kidding. Um, but Mr. Don, I took Votech as a senior in high school. Uh, there was a class I wanted to take out there, and he taught the class. And, uh, but what I loved about Mr. Don was that he taught the curriculum that we faced, but he also taught life to these young men that were in the class. It was all guys in this class. And, and he would share secrets, right? Secrets of being a man. Uh, he didn't call it that, but that's kind of what I've, I, I kind of felt like he was doing, was sharing wisdom. And these aren't the things that you would find in any textbook. They came from his uh, school of hard knocks, uh, ways to be a better man, have better character, to have good practical skills, the secrets that we need if we're facing obstacles in life that we could uh, go forth with. And, I, and I, I took a lot of these. I still, I still uh, cherish some of the, the things that he taught us. I've shared some with my own son in life, and, and he can quote them back. I don't know that he would know that it came from, from Mr. Don, but he knows some of those uh, little secrets that he have. Teachers, teachers mean so much to us. I, I find it fascinating. You know, you think about a teacher a teacher will mold you and make you and help turn you into the person that you become as an adult. And, and we all have teachers that we think fondly of and some that we think not so fondly of. And it's probably because they changed us for the better, uh, even with their discipline or their instruction. Teachers help to change us in our lives. And as I was preparing this message this week, you know, I, I wanted to relay and make sure and help us all to understand that Jesus was a teacher. Jesus was a teacher. You know, we, we refer to him as Savior and Messiah, but he was a teacher. Commonly in the Bible, you hear the word rabbi. We may have recalled, you may recall Mary seeing him after the tomb, call him rabbi, which means teacher, master. Rabbi means master or teacher. A rabbi is one that in the Jewish world, the Jewish law, the Jewish side, they are, or, they are ordained to share uh, God's law, the law of Moses, with those that would hear. A rabbi is. So Jesus was a teacher and known to many that way. He taught many different ways, right? If you look at the way he taught, he would, he would allow questions to be asked and he would answer them. He also would present arguments as it uh, pertained to Scripture. He would use hyperboles, overly exaggerated certain things. He used something called epigrams, which is where you would answer with a terse, terse question or terse answer when a question was asked. 
Uh, I think of uh, when he was having dinner with the tax collectors and the sinners. And they said, what are you doing having dinner with them? And he said, I, you know, a doctor doesn't go to those that are healthy. They, goes to the, they go to those that are sick. Likewise, I'm not here to save the righteous. I'm here to save the sinners. A po- terse point that he would make. But he also would use parables. Parables. And that's where we're going to hang out this morning is one of Jesus' parables. You know, people debate parables all the time. Are parables true or are they not true? What do they mean? How do you interpret those? Well, the simplest way to think about a parable is it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. An earthly story so we can understand it, but allows us to understand heaven through these stories. Now, I, I want to I help frame up a parable a little bit more for just a moment. I want to I put you in the mindset of a parable. Let's suppose that this, world, this room has no windows and has no doors. And we are the only ones that exist in this room. And this becomes our world then. And there is no other world that we know of other than in this room. We cannot escape this room. We don't want to escape this room. This room is all that we know. But little do we know, right above us, there's another sanctuary sitting right on top of us. And they have their own world, their own ways. They have no windows. They have no doors. They exist in their world, their universe right above us. And we don't know about them, and they don't know about us. We exist differently. But what if we could cut a hole in the roof, and we can look up inside of there, and we see that they do things differently than we do? They treat the, uh, the sick differently. Right, the elderly differently. They treat each other differently. They say something, they mean it, and they hold true, true to the truth no matter what. They are really good in what they do. They are righteous in what they do. All of a sudden, we start looking at that world and saying, I want to be a part of that world versus this world. You see, we are of this world, but we look to the world above, and that's the world we want to be, the heavenly world above us. That's somewhat of a parable. What a parable does to us is we understand things from a different perspective. We understand things from the kingdom of God. See, when Jesus taught parables, he was always teaching about the kingdom of God. But he would use earthly terms so we could understand those and get a glimpse of what heaven was like. This morning we're going to look at a parable, the Good Samaritan. We've, we've, many of us have read this. And I want to share some interesting things about it. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. Now, Luke is an interesting read. You have to understand a couple things about Luke as you look at it. Luke was a physician, and so he had an intense focus on detail, a meticulous detail on the history of Jesus' life here on earth. He had an orderly account that he laid things out on. And, and, and so we see details in Luke's gospel that we may or may not see in other gospels written about Jesus. We also see something different about Jesus than we do in the other uh, synoptic gospels. We see that he focuses on his mercy and compassion. I want you to lock that word in your brain, compassion. Compassion upon the Gentiles and the Samaritans. Compassion upon women and children. Compassion on tax collectors and sinners. He focused his attention on Jesus' compassion on others. Compassion. You see, in, in the time of Israel, this, this writing, Israel uh, had a way of looking at things from so, social class. Right? They looked at those in the upper class and the lower class. Those that were Jews and not Jews. They had a very jaded perspective. Now what's interesting And yes, I'm an American. Yes, I'll stand by this flag all day long. And yes, I will defend this flag until I uh, can, can no longer do that. But America has become this same way. We look at different social classes of uh, of people. We differentiate between people. Sometimes we don't have compassion on those that we should. And I say shame on us as a country. Shame on I'm going to say shame on the United States of America. And what I can't get off my mind before I go further 
I had an interaction the other night. I, I, I've had just an, a crazy week this week. Most of you have seen the ups with my, my granddaughter and her birthday, <laughs> birth week, that she celebrated all week this week. But in and out throughout this entire time, I've had ups and downs that are just so hard to explain. I believe the Lord was working on my heart in a mighty, mighty way. You see, one of those days, it was actually her birthday. While we celebrated her day, we also went over to uh, the Connie Maxwell house. And so we were celebrating and showing love to our granddaughter, yet we saw children that, for whatever reason, were homeless. It might have been something that happened in their house. Yet they had people loving on them in their, in their home that they lived in in Greenwood. These young ladies, I'm going to mention two na la names this morning. A little girl named Emma, who goes by the nickname Eminem, and Daisy. They were our host to give us a tour in this house. And their life was changed for whatever reason, and we don't know why. They were placed in this home, but they showed us love and compassion, the same love and compassion that Miss Teresa, their house uh, mother, was showing them. So it, it was kind of a crazy up and down. We had another birthday party that I went to, and in the midst of that, I see a man who can barely walk, bent over a cart, trying to cross a road, and cars would not stop for this man. How does that even work? I don't understand it. And then in the midst of that, I saw a young man run, a young man, Nobody my age, a young man, run out and help this man. I could go on and on. My mind is racing this morning, and I believe the Lord has just put me in a place to share this message as I should. So Luke chapter 10, if you join me, we're going to be in, in verses 25 through 37. We're going to read the entire uh, portion of this, this parable. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit the, king, the e eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so he answered sa and said, You shall love the lo Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by, on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came from where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wound, pouring, out, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which, one of these, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So I, you know, I, I, I don't have any way to test this, but I, if I was a betting man, I would bet or say that this is the most well-known parable uh, in the Bible. I would say that men and women, believers and non-believers, can all quote this story and talk to the story, and they would share the story, but they tend to focus on verses 30 through 35. They don't look at the opening portion nor the latter portion. Uh, anybody, a lot of folks have read this, children know this, and they would come back with, love God, love your neighbor. That's the moral of the story. End of story right there. In fact, in, in pre-K, we teach this class. We read this and we, we read this lesson to the children. And that's typically what comes out of it. Love God, love your neighbor, take care of your neighbor. But we don't go beyond that, right? And, and that's not necessarily wrong. It's just not the entire story. It's not the entire lesson that we need to read from this. 
I've said it many times from this pulpit and also in Bible studies. We have to be willing to dig deeper as we study the scriptures. We can't just settle on the easy piece. We need to dig deep and understand what, what, what are the words behind words or the words within the words. And so let's do some of that this morning. Let's dig a little deeper as we look at God's word. And so if we look at the introduction, the introductory part of this, verses 25 through 29, that's really the introduction. You see, we, we see a lawyer that is interacting with Jesus. Now, this is not a lawyer as we think, right? We think of a, a lawyer being an attorney that would go into court and, and, and defend the law, if you will. But this, this person is an expert in the law of Moses. So it's, it's an expert in God's word. And so as, as he asked Jesus how to have eternal life, uh, Jesus asked him, he pushes back, basically to say to the guy, well, you know what the words say. What do you think it is? You tell me, and how do you read it? And if you, if you look at, at the lawyer's words, you would see that he actually quotes Scripture back, which is perfect, right? This is what this man ought to do. He quotes Deuteronomy 6.5 and Deuteronomy 19.18. To love God with all your heart and soul and your might, and to love neighbor as yourself. Very, very straightforward. But then this man, this expert in the law, um, and, and it even says this, he tries to justify himself. He tries to elevate himself. He comes back with this staunch, egotistically driven question that says, well, who is your neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Right? You have to understand the, the times. You have to understand the culture as you look at this. You see, Jews hated Samaritans. You have to understand that. They also didn't look upon Gentiles. There was nobody that was uh, worth uh, anything unless they also were a Jew. In fact, there was a sect that was so staunch in this, they would say if they, they're not a practicing Jew, then they cannot be your neighbor. And so if we were to have that mindset here in 2021, which is what I always try to do, I, I try to bring Scripture forward to our life so we can understand what does it mean in our life if we took that mindset, we would say, unless you go to Salute a Baptist Church on a regular basis and give like you're supposed to give, then you are not my neighbor, right? That's, that was the mindset that they had at this time. And so he's wanting to know who is the neighbor, who is my neighbor. And so from this, we have this brief interlude, if you will, between Jesus's and, Jesus and this uh, lawyer, this expert on the law, to set up the story within the story. You see, the parable that we know is the story within the story. That's verses 30 through 35. And so let's take a look at that story and see what we can learn from that story this morning. Pardon me while I get a drink. I'm a little parched this morning. And so it starts off, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pick out certain pieces this morning. It starts off telling us a certain man. Now, we don't know much about this man. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's all we know about a man. It's just a man. It's, it can be anybody going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Some, some interesting words in there that we have to understand. Um, first of all, you need to understand Jerusalem sits on a hill. It's about 2,500 feet above sea level. So he's going to Jericho, which is down by the Dead Sea. So, of course, he's going to be going down. There is movement in this scripture that we need to understand because there's a part that is uh, the analogy, if you will, and there's also the part that's reality. See, some people will say parables are only analogies, that they're not true. When Jesus is speaking, it is true. Amen? Regardless of the topic, when Jesus is speaking, it's true. So I look at parables in a way that is both an, an analogy and truth. This actually happened. And so I need you to hang on to the down two from an analogy standpoint. Just hang on to that and remember that. And so the certain man goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And we see thieves that come on the scene. And they beat this man up, this certain man that we know nothing about. They beat him up, they wound him, they take all of his possessions, and they leave him, it says, for half dead, leaving him half dead on the side of the road, on the side of the road. This man is beaten and left for dead. And then 
Look at the words, next, next verse, I think it is, by chance. By chance. Do you think anything in this world happens by chance from a perspective of Jesus Christ? Not at all. But I, you know, when I read this, I actually get a sense of Jesus with a little smile on his face, right? A little bit of irony, wanting to have fun with this story to this expert in the law. By chance, by chance, by chance. There's nothing by chance whatsoever when it comes to Jesus. And so we see three persons come on the scene, characters in the story. We see a priest that comes on. He's from the, uh, he's from the tribe of Aaron, if you will, he's, or the descendant of Aaron. He comes down, he's a priest, so it means he does all the ceremonial things within the temple. He is a man of God without a doubt. He comes upon the scene. Now some, as you read into this, we see that he passes by and some would say, well, a priest was not allowed to touch a dead body. Maybe he saw the man and thought he was dead. We don't know. Maybe he just said, you know what, I'm afraid of the thieves. I can't stop. I got to keep going. We don't know what was in the priest's mind. I wish I did, but he just passes on by. He passes on by. This man of God sees a wounded man on the side of the road and he passes by. Next we have a Levite. Verse 32, likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. A Levite was from the tribe of Levi. He also worked in the temple. He assisted the, the, the priest, but he didn't do the, sac, the, the ceremonial aspect of it. He took care of the temple. This is a, manly, a man of God, a devout man, that should also help somebody on the side of the road. Two men of God walked on by. Now, I want to pause for just a second and think about this road, right? Because we, we think about roads, and we look at roads that are out there, right? We got Wheeler Road right out, right in front of us, two-lane road. Here in 2021, we can see all kinds of roads. We might have a dirt road, right, that, that is one lane or one and a half. It's enough for two trucks to get by most of the time. Otherwise, you have to go in the ditch, but it's okay if you have four-wheel drive. It may be a two-lane road. It may be a four-lane road, and if you're in Atlanta or someplace else, it could be an eight-lane road. But, but this was a road back in these days. Right? If you're in today's world, you could see how somebody, if somebody was in the ditch on this side of Wheeler, you could pass by and maybe not see them. Right? You, could, you wouldn't even have to lock eyes with them. I, I want to show you another picture. This is the, the, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And I don't know if you can see that very well. It's, it's actually two pictures side by side. It's taken in recent times. So you can see two guys walking down the road. And on the right-hand side, you actually see what the road looks like. How hard would it be to not see somebody laying down? Right? It's impossible. It's impossible to pass by somebody on this road. But the two godly men, the priest and the Levi, walked right on by Without a doubt, not even wanting to lock eyes, not wanting to look, look, probably looked up in a way somewhere else. They just didn't want to lock eyes with this guy. They just passed on by and, and didn't help him whatsoever. But now we get to the next verse. And a certain Samaritan is what we're told. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, the injured man, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, first question we would ask about this is what is the Samaritan doing in this Jewish land? Right? What is he doing in this area? He has no business. If I'm a Jewish person, I'm going to say, first of all, he has no business being here. What is he doing on my road in my country in, in here? What is he doing at all? And how could he help? Why would he ever help? What's behind his help? What's he trying to do? And it doesn't matter. Right? As we think about this, just like we can't get in the priest's mind, we can't get in the Samaritan's mind other than to see what he did. And he stops to help this certain man, a certain Samaritan, help the certain man who was injured. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine, and, and put him on his donkey, and he went to the inn, and he helped him there for a night, and then he left the next day, and he went to the innkeeper, and he said, here's some money, two denarii. That's two days of wages. I want you to think about yourself for a second. Would you be willing to do that to somebody that was injured on the road that you did not know? He gave two days' wages to help this person uh, get over his wounds. And he said, if, if it costs more, I'll be back. I'm going to be back this way, and I'll repay you for whatever debt. 
And so we see God places the Samaritan there to help this man that he didn't know. And then we get to wrap up the story, right, as we get to 36 and 37, we actually see the lesson, the lesson that's learned. Now, we close it, and, and Jesus asked the lawyer, right, who was, a, who, who was the neighbor in the story. Now, I want you to really see something, right? We, we have to go back and think about this lawyer, and I'm calling him that because that's what the Scriptures call him, this lawyer. He was so jaded and full of prejudice that he could not even say the word Samaritan. He said, can't see it up there. He said, the one who showed mercy. He was such a prejudiced man that he couldn't even call him by his name or his nationality. Now, Jesus gives him credit for the right answer, and he says, okay, go on and do likewise. So what, what do we learn from this? How can we apply this whole story to where we sit in 2021 what do we do with it and, and you see I, I i believe that if you look at it at the surface there's some pretty simple lessons that we can learn from this especially if we approach it from the mind of a child we, we should act more like a child as we try to uh take the lesson from here right do unto others as they would have you do have them do unto you i can't even say it uh, treat others like you want to be treated right the golden rule the golden rule, that one's simple. At Matthew 7, 12, we learn that. Love God and, and love your neighbor as yourself. The, the lawyer had already said that, said that. You see, children, when they hear this story, they don't have a problem with it because they have the eyes of a child. They don't see race. They don't see ethnicity. They don't see social status. I was at a skating party yesterday. With, with Fallon. She finally had her official uh, birthday party yesterday. And she asked Granddad to skate. And I said, no. Uh, I, I actually said, your daddy is a better skater than I am. Go see him. And so she did. And he was, by the way. But the reason I bring that up is a lot of them were falling. Black, white, red, yellow. It doesn't matter what color the child was, what kind of parents they had. It didn't matter if, if they were rich or poor or anything else. They helped each other. In fact, there was one point where Fallon was in the middle of two other girls, and they said, come on, girls, let's go. So they joined hands, and they skated on the carpet going across the way. They were bonded with one another. They were ready to go conquer the world because they just loved one another. You see, we, as adults, have a hard time treating our fellow man this way. We begin life good as a child, and we don't see anything into other people other than they're good people. But then we grow up, and we become adults, and between the time of being a child and being an adult, we become jaded with the world. We see things as the world tells us to see them. And you might say, well, that can't happen here. This is Saluda Baptist Church, right? We're just like the temple back in Jerusalem. We're not bad people. We're good people. It happens here, folks. When I hear people talk about skin color or ethnicity or other things, why do we do that? Do you think Jesus sees anything other than his children? when he looks at everyone in this room and everyone in this town, he sees us as his children. You see, this man that Jesus was talking to, he had all the right answers, but he didn't have the right heart. He could quote scripture, and he did, but he couldn't even call the man by his name nor his nationality. He just said the one who had mercy. He had all the wrong things inside of his heart. He, he could verbalize it. He could quote scripture. I once worked with a man who could quote scripture, yet he told me he was an atheist. He knew every, just about every book of the Bible. He could quote it left and right, but he was an atheist. It doesn't matter if you can quote scripture. If your heart's not right, it's meaningless. 
We can come into this hall, this sanctuary, and we can put on a good show, but if it's not in your heart, it's meaningless. We have to take this scripture and learn from it and understand how we should live our lives. And you know, I always ask people, which one are you in this story? And we always think about, am I the priest? Am I the Levite? Am, am I the good Samaritan? I want to give you a different twist. You see, if we look at it from a different lens, the lens that I hope and pray we can see, is we're all that certain man. Right? Let's look at this from a heavenly perspective. Let's put some different labels on the story. You see, Jerusalem represents the city of David. We think about the new Jerusalem and when that comes. And so we can picture Jerusalem being heavenly, right? Jericho is perhaps the oldest city in the world. And so it, and it sits right by the Dead Sea. And so if you think about Jericho, all of a sudden you can see worldly, heavenly and worldly. And we all have made that journey, right? We're born into innocence even though we're sinners right off the bat until we come, become accountable for our own decisions. We're born innocent. And I know we have a sinner's heart. And we've all taken that journey in life making our way down into Jericho. And every one of us have been beaten and bruised by this world that we live in. Every one of us in this room has experienced hurt and pain in our lives. And every one of us, until we came to know Jesus, were laying half dead on the road. And see, that priest came by, that priest represents the law. And the law is good, but by itself it can't help you, right? Old Testament proved that to us. You still need something else. We can know the law, but if you don't have it in your heart, it can't help you. And likewise, the Levite that came by, which represents all the services in the sanctuary, you can come to the sanctuary all day long, but if you don't have the Savior in your heart, it's meaningless. And so as we lay there half dead, we've had the law go by us, and it can't help us. We've had the Levite go by us, and he can't help us. But now, those that have accepted Jesus Christ have experienced the Good Samaritan, our neighbor. Who would have thought that Jesus, Jesus would be the one that came along and picked us up, provided us food and clothing, healed our wounds, healed our hearts, placed us in comfort, so we could experience revival in our life. Have you experienced that in your life? Has Jesus healed you? You know, I've often wondered when I read this story, what did this man do after the Samaritan impacted his life? Did he go and tell others? Did he share the story about the Samaritan? You see, we have that opportunity. We always think, everybody I talk to thinks that I, you know, to be able to share the gospel, <laughs> I've got to be able to quote scripture inside and out. I've got to know every story, everything that it, there is in this book before I'm ready. I've got to be ready to go share the gospel. No, you don't. you just got to be able to talk about how Jesus impacted your life. See, it's not about the theology when you're going out to rescue somebody. It's about sharing Jesus. And so I just wonder this morning, as I come to a close, I would ask you to think about that time when Jesus healed you. Have you told anybody about that? Have you shared the good Samaritan, your Savior, with anyone? I don't know how we could not do that. 
Likewise, knowing that he did, in fact, heal us and rescue us, why would we not help somebody else along the way? You see, we see somebody on the road that's downtrodden, right? Maybe they have flat tire. Maybe they have no money. Maybe they have no food. Maybe they have no roof. Maybe they have no friends. What a perfect opportunity for us to just enter into their presence and share love with them, regardless of what they look like, what they act like, even if they could speak English. You know what? You don't have to speak anybody else's language to be able to share love. Love is universal. Think about the power of a hug. Mindy Tucker, every Sunday morning, gives me a hug. And you know what, Mindy? I can feel love. You don't have to say a word. You just hug me. It means the world to me. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and hug everybody that you come in contact with. I'd have DHEC after me all of a sudden. But sheer love. And when you do that, you see what happens is that begs the question, why are you being so nice to me? Why would you do that for me? And your answer is, Jesus. Jesus loves you, and so do I. Right? It's the, we create the opportunity by loving on people to share Jesus. See, that's the deep story here. Love God, love your neighbor, but the Why? so you can tell them about Jesus. You can share the love of Jesus Christ with everybody you come in contact with. As I come to a close, heads bowed, eyes closed, I just pray. I pray over each and every person in here this morning. Father God, you know our hearts. Father, I pray this morning that we find ourselves wrestling, perhaps, wrestling with who we are and who we ought to be. Father, we look at this story and we do see the priest and the Levite, the Good Samaritan, and Father, we tend to focus on them, but Father, I know without a doubt that we all have been that certain man that certain man who was left half dead until you came. You are our rescuer, our savior, our Messiah. And Father, I pray, I pray that each person here and those online would reflect upon this and understand the depth of your love that you have for us. Father God, I just pray that we would wrestle with this and see what we are called to do how we are to have compassion on our neighbor, how we are to love our neighbor, and the why, so that we may share Jesus with all that we can. Father, I love you so much. I thank you so much for changing me, for rescuing me. And Father, I just pray this morning for each and every person that's here and those that are online with us, Father. I pray for that one person that may not know you. They've never experienced your love and your grace and your mercy. And Father, I pray this morning, perhaps, through this message, that they want to know you, that they would ask you into their hearts, Father, that they would seek you as their Savior, that they would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. Father, I pray for those that maybe have become jaded in this world. They've, they know you, but they've allowed the world to gloss over and lean over them, Father, until they become and look like the world. Father, I pray they would turn away from that worldly influence and come running back to you. Father, I pray for those that may be visiting, looking for a church home. Father, we preach the Bible. Your truth is all we know. We preach and teach the Bible because the Bible is 
your word. Father, whatever the situation is for each person, I pray that you would work in a mighty way in their hearts. I pray that you work on all of us. Allow us to be changed this morning. Father, as we depart from this place, that we may go out and share the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many as we can. Not the theology, Father, but that you came to us and took us out of harm's way and rescued us. Father, I just pray that you work on hearts this morning. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? stanzas in that song? Um, four? Hold on. Uh, four. Four? Yep. Uh, the reason I ask that, all of a sudden I'm a blessed man this morning. Victory in Jesus and trust and obey. I mean, what a great day. I, I almost stood up. It, did you notice? I didn't make eye contact with Bill for a few minutes. I, I wouldn't turn around and look at him because I knew once I looked at him, we're going to cut it off. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. I, I would encourage you to be here tonight for the Bible study, 6 p.m., men and women in here. We also have children and youth at the very same time. They'll be upstairs, uh, so come. Come and enjoy the time of study with your church family. Uh, thank you for being here. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just I praise you. I thank you for your, your word, Father, the truth that we see and read each and every day as we study your word. And Father, I just pray that we would all take this lesson, this scripture in our hearts this week and go out in this world, Father, and find, find opportunities that we can have compassion and to share the love of Jesus Christ with everyone that we can find, Father, just looking for opportunities to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, I just pray for your hedge of protection on our mission team this week. Just be with them, guide them, and protect them. We look forward to the return at the end of the week. Father, we can't wait to hear the stories that they'll share about how you worked in a mighty, mighty way. And Father, I just pray that you be with us all. Return us back at the next appointed time. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.